I give so much of myself to people, right? But then it gets to a stage where I'm like, I'm just not doing it anymore. They go, you don't show me attention anymore. It's like, maybe that's for a reason. Paddy Houlihan, welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Thank you so much to Roadman, I love that. Paddy, this is the first time we've done uh, in-studio, so welcome. Um, yeah. I think, I don't know, we're well into episode 440 probably by the time this comes out, and it's our first in-person. I think if I look at another screen with a zoom on it, I'm going to get sick. <laughs> yeah, no, I think everyone's feeling that way. The pendulum has to swing both ways, though, and we were talking off. Uh, air before we can you say that off air when it's in person it's what yeah. it is still uh, we were talking off air about the, the pendulum and these sensationalist headlines and you had your podcast and you discontinued it you know in part because of these sort of snippets and sound bites that people are taking and then making them into big headlines and I think that's super prevalent that we're seeing it even with Joe Rogan and it happening to him but I always think the pendulum swings both ways and it'll swing back the other way to sensibility and long form conversations and that's why I still love the podcast some things can't be put in a container. They can't a complex issue can't be reduced to five hundred words. No, one hundred. So even the podcast I think you you're mentioning there is like is a mixture of two podcasts, and it's um one of them is three hours long. You know, so it's like uh, um for the, the the pendulum swing in there. That's crazy because I was only talking to someone about someone had mentioned the pendulum, and I had said this. And I said I feel like there's kind of like a little there's a change on the horizon or something. And they said the pendulum has to swing all the way up and then it has to come back and find balance. And I was like, has it ever found balance? Because that's the world I want to live in. Yeah, it swings on everything. Yeah, it's, I'm looking at the you know level of inactivity people had and how they prioritise stuff in their life. They prioritised... Um, I love generalisations because that's all we have time for. Yeah. But for a long time, people... A large part of society, they prioritise this chase for something in the distance, a mirage. I'll be happy when, the Stoics call it the hedonic treadmill, I'll be happy when I get to this invisible thing in the distance. Most of the time it was monetary stuff, houses, cars, clothes, clothes, watches. But the pandemic was a little bit of a reset on that and people and said, hold on, you can't walk around 20, 30 kilograms overweight. You're gonna if if a pandemic doesn't get you, a strong breeze is gonna get you. You know you yeah. need to look after yourself. One hundred percent. I think I think uh, John Laddie, who actually introduced me to yourself, great um, man. I had him on the podcast. He's a top lad. John's a great man. You know, um, and it is we can't have conversations here. Like um, the people get offended these days. Where offended used to be part of of free speech, basically. So um, it was kind of like a byproduct of it. Now I ain't about offending people. Let me tell you, I would fight teeth and nail to defend somebody who was trying to, to be it to defend them but like sometimes it gets a little it can get a little bit um you can't have a conversation now because you are going to offend someone so say john um john would have been pointing out the idea that like um heart disease and stuff like that's a massive killer in this country and other countries all over the world and um people who smoke and and drink a lot and don't exercise and um but it that, that that's that's the truth that's not saying that but that could offend somebody because it would feel like someone was pushing them to do something they didn't want to. Um, I'm about I'm about choice and a lot of stuff. So if you want to eat ten burgers a day, eat your heart out. <laughs> That's what I said. If you want to run twenty marathons in twenty days, eat your heart out. You know. So I'm, I'm a lot I'm, about choice. I'm normally of the opinion that I don't really care what you're doing. My the legal code and my moral code don't line up totally aligned. <laughs> And no matter what you want to do, have at it. Like, if you're not hurting someone else in the process and it's making you happy, have at it. But the thing that, you know, me and John Lally talked about a little bit on the podcast where both of us took a little bit of offense, you know, and I'm not, I'm projecting here a little bit, but I'm assuming you're in the same boat, the health and fitness and both mental and physical health. It's such a huge part of your life. It's, it's 24 seven, it's 365. It's not a pill. It's not an injection. It's not an afterthought. So you can't have someone coming along. Or the only times I took offence during the pandemic were people coming along and virtue signalling to me saying, you're not healthy because you didn't take this injection. And it's like, hold on, don't talk to me about health. I was weighing me oatmeal this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's serious, yeah. Weighing oatmeal, you know you're going deep. Um, 
So here's something we probably haven't, uh, haven't this is, well, I'll say an exclusive, but something we haven't disclosed, all right? So I'm obviously in the council, um, and let me tell you, I get to see virtue at its finest. Um, hypocrisy and virtue go hand in hand. That's what I'm starting to realise, because <laughs> um, I have uh, factor 13 deficiency. Um, I couldn't take this injection or this jab or whatever. So what's a factor 13 So deficiency? factor 13 deficiency is basically a blood disorder. That's why I had to retire from the UFC. Um it's a clotting uh, problem, so basically all of the, the, the factors come except the last one, which seals the clot in place, which makes it a little bit uh, dangerous. And so we made a decision after doing research on this, um, but not even on what the vaccine was, but what on mRNA was, um, the, the process of administrating the vaccine. So I had about two years there where, because I have a medical condition, that I ended up in a place in society that I probably thought I never would. Um, I couldn't go in and have a coffee in a place or sit down in a place because they had a medical condition. Um, but they were, and, and no one would have a problem saying to me, oh, you're an anti-vaxxer, and like saying it to me face. And you could have two, three people saying it. But the same people would be the people who would be virtue signaling in the next conversation. So I couldn't um, take an injection. So it was in a situation where people who would be um, he would scream about inclusive, uh, inclusive and and um, and against like discrimination and so and rightly so, had no problem in a few weeks turning all of their morals around and and basically I felt I felt alienated and I'm sure other people did um, not and not, not even over medical conditions or other way they could because maybe the reason they didn't want to take it or or they didn't want to to, to do what somebody was saying what they should do um, and not only that without facts. So it wasn't like someone had a piece of scientific paper saying, here's all the facts, here's all the knowledge, and you're going against science now because we've done all of the research. It's the same. I have friends who, uh, he recovered from cancer, and he was advised not to take the injection because of whatever type of cancer that he had, that it might in interfere with his uh, rehab. And again, ostracized from society. And you know, we, we didn't chat, and you probably don't know super too much about my background. I came through law school before I went away to pursue a career as a pro cyclist. And I remember one of the cases in law school that always stuck with me. Can't remember the case uh, name, but that's not important. The story, it's basically there's three lads out on a fishing boat. The fishing boat get, loses its way badly. One of the lads on the boat gets very sick. Now, they're at a point where they're, they're going to die. If I think it was agreed in the trial. They're going to die if they don't eat. There was no way of catching fish out there before <laughs> some smart ass asks. They didn't have a rod. They no bait. That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> uh, so they decided they were going to eat one of the lads. So one of the lads, the weakest, he was the sickest, and he got eaten. And it came to trial, and they were charged with homicide, and their defense came back and said it was necessity. They, they were all going to die if they didn't eat them. And they were found guilty of homicide because the judge said the function of society is to protect the weak from the strong. And that's what I thought about during that time when people like you with medical conditions were getting excluded from society. The function of society is to protect the people who are getting excluded. And we miss that sometimes. We miss that around homelessness. We miss that around people rehabilitating from drug problems, people with mental health problems. We we exclude those and we step over them on the street. They still do. They still do. There's like... I think it was like 115 uh, homeless people died. So I, I, I would do, do a lot um, in with like um, with groups with the homeless. And like, listen, I kind of facilitate. That's what I say with, 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 with helping the homeless in a way. Because there's absolute angels out there who are on them streets all of the time. That's not me. Every now and again, I get to go out and I'm blessed to be able to be around like powerful souls because people do are, that are in homeless situations. So when you sit and talk to these people and all, you start seeing that they're a lot stronger than a lot of people that you might actually know because they have to, they're forced, they're, they, they, they have to they, they battle the elements, they have to, to understand. But they live, they're live. living in a different world because their need for what they need, have to get, whether it's food or whether it's whether it's uh, to support an addiction or um, anything like that, that becomes their life. Their life is no longer, people are like, why don't they just get up and do a nine to five job? It's like they live in a different realm, but it's because society failed them. Like we're t we 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 treated uh, dr drug addiction and alcoholism and all this kind of stuff as like as like a criminal behavior and basically stuff like that. Where it's known now that it's a, it's known it's, a, it's like addiction is a sickness and it's a it's a human thing. It's a it's a mortal thing if you get me. You know, like so if you where you have somebody, you have the possibility of somebody being able to get addicted to whether it's gambling, whether it's whether it's sex, whether it's drugs and stuff like that. But society looks at them people as in like oh like that's your own fault now. 
But that's not the way we should be looking at these people. Like, and when it comes to say what you're saying on homeless and stuff like that, it's like these people are some of the strongest people and some of the smartest people that you'll ever meet. But they live in a realm where that can't be seen, you know. But you mentioned the word hypocrite earlier on, and I often think about that when you're you're talking about uh, drug abuse there. And you know, I'm, I have friends on to- like couldn't be further on the socioeconomic spectrum. Like some guys who are some of the richest guys in Ireland, some friends who have come up in shockingly terrible, you know, circumstances and still live in abstract poverty. And there's one thing that strikes me is there's almost no connection between money and happiness. But another is it's the snobbery around the different types of drug and how we've categorized different types of drug. And upper class people look down their nose at people that are on heroin on the street and go scumbag junkie he's taking heroin but at the same time they'll have no problem taking a line or two of cocaine in the nightclub at the weekend or more so like more often than the weekend and that that's it um drugs was not a problem until it started crossing classes that's what i start seeing so i grew up in jobstown and um, where drugs was always in my house in the state heroin was was always there now i didn't grow up in the 80s um but my, my family did and and when heroin came to to areas working class areas and stuff like that and all it ravaged them because people that are there in, in bad situations are trying to escape reality as well they're trying to get away from this stuff you know so um but then when when drugs start crossing uh, classes are crossing the, the over to the other side of the city that's when i start seeing it um it kind of coming to like the like the real, we gotta have a bat the war on drugs now, you know. We gotta we gotta go after this and stuff like that. And and you're dead right. It is drugs like 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 cocaine and and, and that's not just Ireland. That has been the world over. So, um, as didn't cocaine start in like Hollywood and yeah. then trickle down into the hoods? If you get me, you know. And, but you know, such a detachment. Like I remember going to school. Uh, a lad I went to school. Rest in peace. But a nice enough lad. You know, I would have played football with him and been close enough pals with him. You know, he was killed in gangland killing you know drug dealing you know doing stuff he shouldn't have been not endorsing that but and he was killed i remember coming home i was riding the bike in france my ma picked me up at the airport and she's like do you hear your friends after getting killed he's it must have been a case of mistaken identity and i was thinking it definitely wasn't a case of mistaken yeah. identity he probably had that coming to him but in then in law school and you know seeing people and their their casual adoption of cocaine but with a total detachment on that killing in North Dublin with a total detachment on the consequences of drugs where drugs come from where that supply line comes from they think it's you know made in Marks and Spencers or delivered to them through you know a delivery driver that, that that same um, kind of like shield or block um, is not just for drugs it's with, it's with everything you know it's, it, it, it stops people from seeing homelessness it stops people <coughs> from seeing the parties that have systematically created homelessness through their policies and um, and they're able to just disappear, basically. So the the drug problem in 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 the world, if you look at places like Portugal, who have um to release drugs, so they basically they all drugs are um are, are legal. Um, crime went down, thing went down because it's it becomes a human thing as well, where the 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 kind of when you take away the want or you take away the you can't have kind of situation, it does take away a little bit of the people the addiction uh, property to it it also takes the cool factor when yes. you're a kid like what did you want to do when your ma yeah. said to you you can't play football after dinner well, the only thing you wanted to do was play football after dinner yeah 100 percent. And, and what you were saying there so you you mentioned something there and if you give me a, like a minute or two on this will country and explain what, what my view of this is that so um you you mentioned like someone grew up in really really nice house uh, things and then someone grew up in absolute squalor um to me, our bodies are just kind of like a shell or like a vehicle to hold um, hold their spirit and hold their, their soul, if you must, you know? Um, and things like greed and, and lust and and um, like jealousy and all of them things are not generally bad things. They're sensors. So the sensors so we can actually touch up close to these problems or these things that our body would want to do and we get to practice so we get to get better at not being greedy. We get to get better at not um, having 10 kids because you can't stop your addiction to probably sleeping with, having multiple sexual relationships, yeah, in a way, and then you've got 10 kids running around. And to me, the reason why it is, so say if you grew up in a, in a working class housing estate or something like that, you will get to meet this stuff very early. 
So you will get to meet the idea of like, like fear would be another one. I'm going to have to face this fear. Where sometimes you mightn't have to, you might be too protected if your life is too comfortable. Um, now I'm not saying fear doesn't happen in different ways, but it mightn't happen for a long time until you're older. And you might get to a certain age, so you just run for it for the rest of your life. And you might not even know you're running from it. To me, this body and this, 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 all we have here, we are humans, we're mere mortals. When we go to the other side or when we die or what we do, people go, ah, you're just dying, you're going to hold on the ground. You absolutely do not. 100% you do not, all right? And this process here is about being able to transcend through that. There's going to be nobody standing at the pearly gates going yes and no. So the message of be good and you go to heaven, be bad and you go to hell, it's kind of like a kind of like the title on a book, if you get me, okay? Because if you do loads of bad in your life, when you transcend and you go to the other side, you will be looking, and you won't be able to get through the badness. You won't be able to get through that things that's facing you. And you will probably spend the rest of your time wherever that space is. If you don't have to deal with that, if you don't have to deal with the badness because you were really good in your life, you will bounce out of the lobby and you will start going into the other <laughs> realms of where like where we need to be. This is a process. This is a big exercise, I think. And, and our body is just a whole, like our spirit, our soul, and the sensors, these are all tests every single day. You mentioned growing up in Jobstown. And I remember pretty vividly the first, one of my first days in first year in school. And you're in the yard and it's your sort of first time experiencing this. The heart rate's elevating, the palms are getting a bit sweaty and you're like, I'm going to be in a fight. There's a fight coming. You do experience them, this sort of sensation and this, some people won't encounter this, you know, until they're, you know, 45 years old on Dawson Street coming out of a nightclub and they're like, oh my God, this is the first time I've felt this. Yeah. But when you are in working class housing estates, this is something you're confronted with earlier in life. And talk to me about that first experience and how that led you to start fighting. Um. Every day, I would have dealt with that, like, and in a, in a good way, you know, like, and, and sometimes to your friends, sometimes they, 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 you know, I think bully is a hard word because bully can happen in so many ways, but sometimes it was just another kid that was a little bit pissed off and you were a little bit smaller than him and he gave you a clue. It wasn't deeper than that. You know, people would be like, well, he must be a bully and have psychological issues. Like, no, we all grew up in a rough place. I was blessed, so when I wrote my book, The Hooligan, I wrote in that, that my house was a safe haven. I was able to go back to my house. We never suffered any abuse or anything in my house. My mother was, my mother still is the most incredible woman I've ever met in my life. She doesn't hold any grudges. People have done her terrible things, bad things, and she would send them nothing but prayers. Mars you know? are great, aren't they? My mother, <laughs> she's, she's invincible in that way, you know? Um, so, but then other kids I know, maybe people a little bit further around, not, you won't say who close just so people can recognise people or whatever it is, but, but they wouldn't have had safe havens to go back to. So, when I was out in the street, it was like I was getting thrown into the ring for a little while and I'd be like, hey, and then I go back to my house and I'd be like, ah, that was mad. And I kind of recover. Where I think some kids, their spirit, or maybe even as young adults, is getting chipped at every single day of their life. And by the time they get to a certain age, they, they have to consume something or do something to just escape reality. They're trying to escape their body. They're trying to escape the responsibility of these sensors that I'm talking about. Because the minute they get a lot of money, they, they, they spend a lot or the minute they, they, they get like say a, a good relationship they start they need to be untrue or unloyal and they need to have maybe a girlfriend on the side all of these things as they're getting older so they, but because they don't know how to understand that like how to just enjoy now well it's almost like their natural resting state is conflict so they're trying to uh, so they've grown up in this constant conflict in their house so as they journey through life if they find a partner that's very peaceful it's almost like well i need to chip at this to, to get back to my state of conflict yeah because that's what i know and that's what i need it's interesting though that you were going out and you were able to get into these scraps but then you were coming home into the safe haven because that's very similar to the life of a fighter where you're going out stepping into the limelight the public eyes you're scrapping mm -hmm. in the octagon but then you're going away and you're going back to the safe environment to hone skills to a very disciplined existence and then stepping back in again and it mirrors what you experienced as a kid yeah like, and, and safe haven i mean like we were broke we we hadn't got a, we had a lot of money it was like like you couldn't get down and take like pick whatever yogurt you want out of the fridge you'd probably be lucky if that was yogurt you know that kind of stuff but, but did you know you were broke no, no, I didn't like. Um, 
I can't remember who I think it's Tupac says it in a song, but he was like, like, it's like we had nothing, but we had everything in a way, and we did. I had as much love as I needed. I had as much like a spiritual guidance that I needed. All of that kind of stuff in my way. Like, and religion wasn't shoved down my throat. Football teams weren't shoved down my throat. All of these things that I think that people kind of like to get aligned to because they're born somewhere, you know. Now you mentioned Jobstown, so Jobstown is a place that I love, and 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 it's always somewhere that would be close to my heart. It shaped me. It made me who I am. The adversity I let it in, and I let it shape me. But I also spent a lot of time in uh, in a place called Lanadown in Anderson's Town in Belfast. Um, Jordan, Jordan, a heavy times. So probably 93, 95, 96, you know, coming up to the Good Friday Agreement where there was a lot of... So I understood a few things of, like, madness. I'd be going back to Jobstown and there'd be, like, a fight on the road and I'd be like... And they'd be like, oh, it was mad. I'm like, you think that's mad? <laughs> well, no sure. Madness, absolute madness I, I, I witnessed in Belfast. Like, I witnessed, like, two, three hundred people on a field fighting against, basically, the, the army in the corner. And they would be shooting um, shooting plastic bullets into the crowd. And, and I, can't, I was only young, you know what I mean? And I seen true um, discourse in the, how the media repeat part stuff as well, very young. So I understand this as an adult. Um, I would see somebody, I don't know, maybe maybe getting a hurt in, in, in a situation. And then on the newspaper, I would see how how they had aggravated the, the, the police or they had done something when it was the absolute opposite. But these anchor points are so important. Then you spoke with John Lally, mutual friend of ours. Uh, you know, his dad, I'm not sure how much you know about his dad, but his dad's yeah, one of the yeah. best bike riders Ireland's ever produced. Nah, whoop the lad. The lad. He still rides with us on a Saturday, every Love. Saturday, and he's mid 80s. But me and John spoke about this at length, and it's the idea of doing hard stuff. And having these hard anchor points in your life, you're talking about, you know, a rough environment in Jobstown, a rough environment living in Belfast. But when you come along and you have a little bit of adversity in your life, then it's not like, oh my God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. You have an anchor point and go, yeah. it's a bad day, but it's not that bad. Like I I encourage everyone to have them in cycling. You know, there's a big culture in cycling at the moment, they're training indoors. I'm like, get outdoors, train in the weather, train in the snow, train yeah. in the rain. Because some of the experiences that I look back on the former year, you know, racing in Canada. And I remember one race in particular going out there and I was staying in a hotel near the start line and I looked down and everyone's wrapped up in scarves, long gloves, you know, ready for proper winter. And I was like, we're bike racing here. And I was like, you know what, f*** them. I'm going down shorts and jersey, no gloves. I'm on the start line. Lads are looking at me going, what is this lad up to? And I'm like, not even, this is a grand day back in Ireland. What are you on about? And it was like immediately like he's here to race. He's not here here training. He's here to race. And um, but and I, I froze to pieces. Like got finished. Got hypothermia. You know, shaking. Couldn't use my hands for days after. But I'm out in a race now. Two three years later, and I'm like, Jesus, this is very cold. You have that anchor point and go. It's cold, but it's not as cold as that day was. Hundred percent. And the thing is, a lot of people have that the opposite way. I think. I think where like sometimes things can happen that are absolutely the end of the world when they're really not. Sometimes like we we in, I hear stories all of the time, and I I'm honest with people. I'm a coach to to a massive community, and I'm the head coach there. I'm the I'm the I'm the head gorilla. You know what I mean in a way. So so I guess some people saying some stuff to me, and some stuff could be like, shit, that's a serious situation. Like I'm trying to give them guidance, but then some of it I'd be like, let's take this away, take that away, and they're like, it's like that's bullshit. It's nothing, yeah. and they're like. Do you know what? When you put it like that, you're right. <laughs> so it, it's the idea of being able to have them anchor points. And, and now nobody's problems are, 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 are able to be gauged, I think, by other people as well. Because we don't know how, how it affects people. But some people need to toughen the f*** up. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm not saying that, like, that, I mean, for me and my circle in that way, if, if you're getting, say, they come to and they see the race and they see the snow, and that's enough to not make them even go on the bike now. That's where you need. Like, you would be going like, hold on here. You need to get on the bike at least, because that's the start to eat to realize that even that you couldn't do it, you couldn't finish the race. If you don't get on the bike, you'll never even know. But you know what? When you zoom out and you take that principle of doing hard things, and the more I start thinking about it, it's more of a, a principle that governs my life. It's everything. It's doing the hard things. Say this evening, you know, long day. We're gonna <coughs> we're doing this podcast, and you're going right this evening. What am I gonna cook? What's the easy thing? What's the hard thing? The easy things take away. What's the hard thing? Yeah. It's getting, it's putting the backpack on. It's walking to the shop, filling it with groceries, coming back, chopping it. What's the easy thing? Driving into the car to work. What's the hard thing? Cycling in. What's the easy thing? Skipping the gym session. The hard thing, doing the gym session. The hard way is always the right way. 
do, do you think there's something in that in society to kind of like I don't know um, like when you see like the introduction if you, if you go back 10 years say for, for, for iPhones or whatever it is like that to introduce this kind of like um, like stabilised state of people in a way like if we just keep everybody everything handy everyone more efficient more smooth everything people will just basically be compliant and and people will not have that that pushback that um that hardcore or them anchor points that you're talking about imagine what happens when 20 years when it rolls forward like um someone asked me i think it was it was actually the conversation we had here about my, my young lad and it's like like i would be like if he walked on a building site monday to friday now I would exp- like he'd probably need therapy, you know what I mean? In the way it was the same built as like I walked on as a kid, you know, and it was like he just rolled off with these things. Now I know what society gets better. We we get to highlight stuff and we get to recognize stuff, which means that like that was bad and maybe we were doing it for too long and that needs to stop. We absolutely understand that that happens, but then you get people that it's kind of like it's their job, and they're like, right, what can we find now that was like that was basically maybe a little bit kind of controversial in a way and we need to like outcast it now and make a big campaign about it and stomp it out and let's make it all safe again like if we're if it's a if it's too safe everything's just too safe all of the time and we concentrate on like let's like let's nobody's ever gonna die ever again like it's like are you having a laugh like i don't want that life i want to die someday i want to go to, to, to wherever which what's happening I'm in the journey now of having I've, I'm my fourth kid on the way. Um, I've built a lot from absolute scratch in a way. So as I mean, it's like I was never given like a deposit for my gym. I was never given like things that I have in my life. I made it with my hands and I feel that that I know that's in my body. And my kids, when I have my kids, that's in them. I can see it in them, even in their behaviors as my kid is shame, it's just two, uh, three years of age now. And he's mad. He wants to play outside. He wants to be in the muck. He wants to skid around. He's like, <laughs> he likes a bit of um, um, the YouTube and stuff like that as well. But he gets it in moderation. But but that's what he yearns for. He wants to go to the mountains. He wants to do these things. And that's to me is like um, when you do it in your life, it actually does go into your kids. And yeah, you definitely need to be that example that you yeah. want. I, I talked to because behind the podcast, we have a coaching company and we coach uh, cyclists and okay. we coach them. And a big folks, it used to be when I started out the coaching company I started it when I was in France and I was trying to be a pro cyclist and I was broke I went to law school and you know talk going back to when we were talking about you know growing up poor and never knew you were poor I remember being in my mom's a few weeks ago and ordering a takeaway and she was telling me a story about she's like that takeaway you have to spend 50 quid on sushi she's like I remember walking from here to Fairview to take a fiver out of the ATM machine for dinner because it was the only ATM machine in Dublin that would give fivers <laughs> And she's like, I didn't have the money for the bus fare down and I didn't want to waste money on the bus back because it'd be less food. She's like, you're spending 50 quid on sushi. I'm like, yeah. So it was coming from that. You know, I I didn't get law school fees handed to me. There was no like, there's your law school, go and enjoy it. It was like, you know, you want to go to college? You know, work on the building site in the summer. Take, save your money, pay your bit for college, get your loan from the credit union. So when I got a contract over in France, I, law school loans are kicked back in so I need to start paying back the law school loans so I was like right I have an internet connection how can I make a few quid at an internet connection and part of cycling is as I'm sure UFC and we get into it yeah. in a minute you train hard but you rest hard well yes so I was resting hard so I was like feet are up but I have a laptop and I have an internet connection let's figure out how to make money and that's where the coaching company started from from this shitty little bedroom outside a town near close to Bordeaux started from there and it was an entrepreneur of necessity, I, I tell people at the time. But it, you learn so much from that, you know, being forced to do that stuff. You learn just, there's there's something about a back against the wall. Because for yes. me at the time, it was quit your dream of being a cyclist and go get a job in law or else figure this out. And it's like, shit, going to the head here. I need to figure this out. And the clock is ticking because that trigger is getting pulled soon. And I tell you, you get some creativity and inspiration from that situation. And I just don't think a lot of the back, the backs are going to end up against the walls now. And, and maybe like you, know, did you ever hear that saying that, um, like, um, weak people create hard times. Yeah. Hard times create, um, hard times create tough people. Tough people create, um, good times. And good times create. We it goes around in a circle in that kind of way. Like I don't know what kind of phase we are at that. I've got to question myself now. What phase are we at at that? Because I would do everything in my power for my kids, all right? But I, I know, or maybe I have, I have the sense, on, and I don't know if everybody has this, to, that they're going to have, they have to get adversity. They have to feel what cold water's like. 
Like, if my kids were like, oh, it's too cold, get me a wetsuit. It's like, no, you got to try it, get in, you'll be grand, breathe it out, breathe it out. Ah, oh, I am grand. And then they play in the water, or a little bit of it's adversity. Now, we don't want them going through the adversity I went through, but the back is going to, they're going to have to understand what that feeling's like, what you were saying. Well, do, you, do you worry about that with the kids? What's the saying? Show me a great man who's the son of a great man. Yes, and this is it, because this is what I was going to touch on now, right? So, we are in a situation in this country with, like, and this pops straight away from what we're talking about, we're a housing crisis, okay? So, in the famine, the land grab happened and the land, the land basically was, was rented to, to the citizens. I won't even say Irish citizens, state citizens that called this place home, basically, all right? So we're in a situation now where a large percent of this country um, owns, a la- or a small percent of this country owns a large percent of the, of the, the property in this country, basically. So um, say for an example, um, give me two minutes on this as well so I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't butcher it. So we have a program in Ireland called the HAP program, right? So which is the housing assistance payment program, which most people would need need now these days because they can't rent and they can't buy. Okay, so if you're earning under thirty six thousand euro, you can apply for it uh, to to be on a, a social housing list, which would take twelve years in this country, right? My girlfriend's from Liverpool, so and I communicate with people over there how long it actually takes over there. Okay, it takes twelve years to be housed, so you will be waiting twelve years. So in that place, they will give you um, the housing assistance. So HAP, all right? HAP can be up to, like, up to 1,900 quid, okay, a month. And it's kind of like, yeah, well, this is great. We're like, we're housing people and we're helping people to be housed. Then we need to go back to what I just said. A small minority in this country owns a large amount of the property, okay? So when they're waiting to be housed into a council house for 12 years, the taxpayer's fund that a public portion will be paying this to a private landlord. So say if, I don't know, say if some Fianna Fáil or Fianna Fáil or Sinn Féin TD or whatever it is, they own four properties and they have four people in there at a HAP, paying for paying HAP. In 12 years, they will own them four properties outright and they could still rent them basically, okay? But then they, they, have, they die because we all have to die. And then they pass them on to their kids and their kids become landlords, basically, to people who are working nine to five, who are people, who are, are the children of people who have worked nine to five. So we are going into a direction where this is only going to get worse, and there's a reason why it's not getting solved. The homelessness, when someone's lying in a doorway or someone's dying on the street, and it's it's on the newspaper and stuff like that, and all that's probably forgive me for saying this and I don't mean it this way but it's one of the biggest advertisements to why pay our mortgage because we're rootless and we will take your house off you and we will put you on the street oh you want you want you want accommodation we have a we have a hostel down here for you but you have to be out in the morning and then when you look at how much money's going into this all right then you realize this is a business so they would be renting beds. If you go onto the DHRA and I get some of the reports and stuff like that from it because because I'm a counsellor I get to see this stuff. I know what's going on. They could fix this tomorrow and we would have no housing problems. But not only that, if we don't have housing problems, guess what goes down? The rent. It's the really price of difficult. But this is why stories like yours capture the public imagination so well. Because it's really hard to break out of the class structure. Mm-hmm. It is really hard to go from working class to middle class or middle class to upper class. Because it's generational wealth you're building. And, you know, you talk about the homeless thing and it's... Uh, I'm sure with these councillors and you know I know you're in the council and politicians they're getting reports and it's numbers and I fall into this with the podcast at times as well where you're looking at stats and you're looking at download numbers but behind every download number behind every statistic of someone who's homeless it's a person it's a story Mm -hmm. there's a girl down that I'm living above a shop here where we're recording at the moment there's a girl that uh, begs outside the shop and you know I'd often come in from training and there's a little wall there and I'd sit with her and just shoot the crack and you know how are you getting on today and be yapping away with her and she's living in a tent and she's living with a tent because you know she's a real good looking girl for a homeless girl she's a real looking girl, good she's a good looking girl for any girl yeah but she happens to be homeless and she's real cool tattoos funky really looks after herself what she eats even though she's homeless she's had a bad situation it's put her homeless but she's terrified to go into the hostels because she's a good looking girl she's like i keep getting sexually assaulted and let me tell you there's men that are six foot tall muscles <laughs> like scary men in a way like what, what your vision would be and they won't go into the hostels i see this all the time they say that there's like there's such thing as dry hostels and stuff like that and maybe there is somewhere but i've never found them i once rang um for a guy on a sunday 
Uh, I think it was at 10 o'clock at night, and I think it's half 10 that the beds come on. There was seven beds in the whole city. Seven beds, right, in the whole city for, 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 for people who were on the streets. That's the emergency accommodation, okay? Another night, um, I rang, I won't say which charity it was, but people need to be very careful with all of these charities as well. And as I said, like I am here to, to, to be a voice, and if people want to chop me down and attack me, I said about the Denzel Washington thing just before this, I said, the devil doesn't come for people who do his, who, who do his work, basically. He leaves them alone. The devil comes for those who are fighting against the toyed and splashing against it, and I don't care. I will put my hands up and I will fight. They can say what they want about me, they can try and make me out. You just got to come and meet me, and you'll know exactly who I am. You know, it's like, Oh my God, he's actually all right, you know. He's, and and that's I I don't do that for I. This is always who I was before the UFC, after the UFC, um. But I rang, and there was two lads in one of the charities. People need to be careful of the charities because every time I see something, it's like, oh, let's give this money to the PA the house. Oh, let's give this money to 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 the Simon community. Oh, let's give this money to put Peter McFerry. And I'm kind of like, wait, hold on. These are nearly like big businesses now. Let's jump in and talk about UFC because that must have been just such an exciting ride like i think about uh i know you're not a huge cycling fan but there was a period in cycling in the early 90s when this group of lads came from the states you'll know some of the names because they're some of the most iconic in any sport ever it was like lance armstrong came over from parking all the stuff around dope and they yeah, came yeah. over and they cut through a forest they were these american kids cracking into this european tradition when i think about ufc i think about you lads fighting that same fight ufc was unknown the brand was unknown i remember watching it late night t you to be up late to watch ufc <laughs> on with a pirate satellite dish out the back my, my cousin used to install satellite dishes with a pirate satellite dish i think he used to be on bravo at about two in the morning yeah. you'd get it and then you lads came along and you made it mainstream and i just i was living in the states at the time i was still trying to make a career as a cyclist and i remember the first time i ever seen an Irish lad on a billboard. I was in Boston for a bike race and I seen McGregor on a billboard. I was like, what? He's from Dublin and he's on a billboard in Boston. What's going on here? How exciting was that to be a part of that journey? Man, I, it, we, I looked out the window of Boston at the same hotel I talked about and I seen uh, Connor on a bin and I was blown away <laughs> and the bus as well. Like, what? what's going on here? Like, this is... Uh, it's... See... Special group of people came together there. That's what that was. Um, incredible group of people. Um just just wanted it just was willing to pay the process was willing to pay the piper is what he said you know what I mean and willing to do whatever it took and um, when I first started and um, there was no division for me so basically there was no 125 pound division no flyweight division it was either WEC so the UFC wasn't even kind of like oh uh, hold on because there's no divisions and not only that but my training partner Ashlyn Daly who was it was a female fighter as well there was no females fighting in the UFC but not only that Dana Whitehead came out and said there will never be any females fighting in the <laughs> UFC. So if we were against the odds, we were against the odds because they didn't even the place didn't exist yet. So when we were putting it together, we were training. I remember. So Ash would have been Ash is Ireland's first um, world champion in mixed martial arts in because um, Ash was like kind of leading the way at the start and like on television and I think she'd done the thing on Channel Four and all. I remember being like, "This is madness!" Like so, um, I would have been only young. I would have been about nineteen years of age when I when I started at the gym, eighteen. The time, uh, and a baby on the way, and I just, I just wanted to change my life. So, but when the UFC thing happened, I remember walking into the gym. We were, it wasn't a big fancy gym at this time. It was still a little small gym, still a kind of thing. And Connor had signed for the UFC. Now, five years before this, someone named Tom Egan had fought in the UFC. He had from a gym, didn't go really well from. Nobody really knew about the UFC still after it. But we were all in that stadium that night. We were all standing there watching Tom fight didn't go well for Tom and then five years later all of us made that walk so I was the second Irish man to make a walk from the dressing room after Tom Egan but it was like it was even the style that you brought to the whole thing I remember a press in Dublin, conference sorry, in Dublin. <laughs> I remember a press conference and it was McGregor was sitting to your left side you were wearing this three piece suit the leanest man I've ever seen because I was a cyclist <laughs> and we were all about cutting weight I was like holy shit how lean is this lad the hooligan and I think McGregor said something along the lines of how good does the hooligan look in the three piece suit and I was like these lads aren't playing around like I've not changed the game it was a Brandon masterclass 
Gone as, gone as a general, you know what I mean, in that way. Because in the fourth one in the Dublin uh, thing, I think even Dublin, I wore it. I think it was like, I ran around looking for one of my T-shirts from the club. So one of the, the SPG T-shirts, because I wanted to represent that on the stage of the thing. Um, Connor was like, I'm going to have a dicky bow, I'm going to have a short. He had it ready to go, you know what I mean? Where I would have probably still been struggling a lot with like, I need to get this guy out here and Aten after that. I need to fight this guy, I need to win. Where like I think Connor was a lot more confident at that time than maybe I'm a little bit more confident now, I'm a little bit more mature. I think maybe he maybe had that a little bit early and, and that helped us all. So to me, I always call him the general. So he was the general uh, at that time. Um, and he was the one who was kind of like, he was fighting the card. Now we were all doing our own work. We all did our own work. That's where there's no one can fight the fight for you. You know, but um, when the Dublin card came up, I think that's when the world really knew, you know. But when he when he knocked out uh, Diego, um, not Diego Bandero, it was um, first guy, I was at the Ultimate Fighter. So I had already been, I was in Vegas, and I was trying to get on the Ultimate Fighter, which is like Big Brother, which you fight. Yeah, I remember watching house, it, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? And I was I was there, and I was telling Dana about like, like one of my friends that arrived last week, and he was like, oh shit, like you were with that Irish kid. Like, and I'm like, yeah, am I not going to miss? There's 10 of us going to walk in that door. And I told the Tommy Tiernan story, you know, where like, you would come with sleep mags and phone numbers. Down, and that's what I said to him. Like, and he was like, he was laughing. This was the interview process, which was hard. Um, that didn't go well for me. I got, got this horrible wrestler, kind of like a Khabib style, but doesn't hit you either. Like, so horrible style. Lost two rounds there. Came back to Dublin, slipped a disc, had to get surgery, all of this stuff. It was just so much, like, Adversity, but as I said, all of that adversity is part of your spirit crown. Um, I got the, I got the phone call five weeks before UFC Dublin to sign for the UFC. So five weeks before, and you headlined UFC Dublin, didn't you? The second one I headlined, yeah. So I I, I opened the show in the first one, so it was the Berserker, the Norse man covered in animal fat and hallucinogenics running down the hill. That's what that's what that's what a uh, Berserker was back in uh, Celtic times. And um, so I opened the show. I ran down and I was the one who like create the madness and, and put it in you know and that was it I was the hooligan he is real he's in he was in there he's not there anymore but he used to be there when people look at UFC now and UFC is a billion dollar global brand now that's not what it was when you lads arrived no. it was this rinkety dink almost car park fight club cult brand and if people said they were into it you kind of looked at them going like, wow well, like that's a weird thing to be into does McGregor get enough credit for because his extracurricular activities, he's in the newspapers every week for stupid shit. And does that take away from how big of an influence he was and you lads were as a collective at launching UFC to that brand? No, he doesn't. And he deserves more. Um, as I said to you, sometimes the, the devil only comes, he doesn't come for his own, you know. So with the newspaper stuff and all, what Connor to me is a uh, is um Maybe we should focus a lot more on what our governments are doing and, and the corruption that's going on in these uh, places and, 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 and be more open about this stuff. And like Connor's a sports star. If Connor wears a tracksuit, he'll tell you the price of it tomorrow in the newspaper. And I'm like, I don't think Connor really cares about that. And I don't think that, sh I don't, if I, this is my opinion, that should not be the news. The news should be about the serious stuff that's going on, you know. Now, but Connor was an abs is an absolute iconic Irish sportsman. Uh, and that's the way people, uh, whether you want to see it or not, it's just. He is the one who broke that. He changed it, the price of that company. And Dana knows that. And they all know that. You know, now, how did I come into it? How did we come into it? I think maybe at the same time, all of the kind of the, all of the classes were represented, if you must, okay? So, um, Carl Pendred was there. Ashlyn Daly was there. I was there. Um, Artem was there. Connor was there. Artem's a beast. Another animal, yeah. And you had people on the... An, an animal. An ab absolute animal. And, and a fighter of hearts, you know. But what I mean is that, like, we struck a few... Neil Searley was there. We struck a few, all of the classes nearly, or all of these communities at the same time. So what happens is each person, player... Someone already told me just the other day, they were like, when I first seen Connor, I was like... That's brilliant. Like the kids in Crumbling have this icon and all. I was like, wouldn't it be great if Tala had somebody like that? Yeah. He said, it was only the next day after that. I was like, oh my God. Now he's one of my students now. But he was like, I found you. And he was like, and then I'd seen your message and it was all about like, like about what, what you are, community and all of this kind of growth in your community and all. And he was like, and this is what, this is why I'm here now. 
you know but don't we hold athletes up to be too much like you're talking about you know we need to focus on news being news and sport being sport like I heard some interview I'm not sure how long ago it was from McGregor and they were asking him some question he's like I think you're confused on what I do he's like I get into a cage and I smash people's faces yeah. open for money yeah that's what fighters do that's what athletes do they race bikes they run as fast mm-hmm. as they can but we want to pull them into you know Tyson Fury last day before his title fight he's getting asked about uh, Daniel Keenahan connections mm-hmm. it's like it's not what he does Tyson Fury maybe he'll give you a bit of a sing song at the end of a fight but he's a fighter let fighters fight <coughs> As we said, the media don't want that. They don't really want to be talking about that. That doesn't sell the papers. That doesn't. They want to be printing stuff on the front of the paper about connecting some athletes to something or whatever it is, and and that's it. We just we need better. We just need to expect. Yeah, you know, it's our it's our own fault as well because we need to expect more from our media. I don't know. We're not picking up a paper that's talking shit about something on the front of it. Like I want to see what's going on. I want the truth. Like I check the dates twice on the newspaper now because I don't believe it that much. <laughs> How dialed were you as on? When I look at cycling and I talk to other high performance athletes, I'm always amazed at how they're high performance in just tag. And they're not doing the basic stuff that cyclists have been doing for, you know, since Armstrong changed the game in the early 90s. The attention to detail in cycling, like I was half joking about Wayne the Oatmeal earlier on, but that is the life of the cyclist. It's you know, constant. I remember my previous girlfriend starting going out with her and she moved in. She's like, what's going on here? And I was like, I have an altitude tent like chains around the bed <laughs> for sleeping and I'm taking, you know, pulse oximeter readings yeah. every night going to bed. Cyclists are just, it feels like they're moving the needle all the time. Yeah. How dialed is UFC and that type of stuff? Well, the building the engine thing um, comes from cyclists um, for, for MMA. So it's not too far away, to be honest, because it takes a lot of the pressure off... Um, of our, our back and our legs and our knees and stuff like that. So a lot of my stuff would have been done in the pool. And then you probably know Julian Dalby. Yeah, um, so iconic or yeah. cyclists. And you'd know Paul uh, Doyle. Yeah, so Paul, I teach Paul's son, Ryan, and stuff like that. So um, I've done a little bit with them. And um, we did a little bit on Iceland as well about building the engine. So in one minute intervals and like like the, the green, the red and the yellow, or the, the orange zone. Um, so what you were saying there, so... Um, Checking your heart rate in the morning to see where your recovery heart rate is. If your heart rate is up, you've got to take the day off. You've got to sleep, and then the, because recovery is a massive part of it. And are they still doing that? As like, how much are they moving the dial? How much are you connected to that elite level now in UFC? Um, well, the idea is what I do now. So um, I'm into athlete development. That's what I'm in. I'm not into like. I, I'm, I was going to say I'm not into people winning oh yeah I'm into people winning but I'm into people see, I'm into watching people do the process and then seeing it coming out and going right that's it and then monitoring rechecking it and going again so basically it takes about five or six years I think to get somebody to, as a professional athlete in, a, in MMA but some people if you wire down the time that they put in could be only four years they're in the gym six years but the work has only been doing done it's interesting I had a consultation with a, a buddy of mine and he's a podcaster he's one of the top podcasters in the business genre when I was launching the podcast and he was saying to me look if you publish once a week with your podcast this is the sort of growth you can expect and I was like well how do I shortcut that and he's like publish five days a week (laughs) there's five years of growth in the same time someone else is publishing once a week is getting and I was like that just spoke to me as a cyclist because I don't feel like I was ever I don't feel like I was ever the most talented in anything like all through school I was never very talented but when it came time to crunch for exams, you know, I could turn into a Jedi Knight for two, three weeks where I'd hardly sleep. No one had seen me. And I'd know books inside out. Like, it was preparation. And that's what got me through school. That's what got me through university. That's what got me through law school. That's what gave me some limited success in cycling to a point. I feel like I got the very, very most out of it. So that's why when I started hitting the podcast and I was like, let me run. How do I turn this dial up? Yeah. And... Uh, Athletes can do that, especially when they've people like you in their corner to shortcut stuff and say, here, look, I went down that road for two years and it's a waste of time. Turn left at the end of there because right's a dead end. Mate, you want to see the people I talk to now and I say it and I'm going to be smashing my head off that wall there. Like I say it to them and they look at me like, yeah, but you're lying. You know, and I'm like, why would I lie to you? Like, I just don't. And I don't have time for people. You know? Like, I give I give so much of myself to people. Right? But then it gets to a stage where I'm like, I'm just not doing it anymore. They go, you don't show me attention anymore. It's like, maybe that's for a reason. 
Maybe because I have to chase you. Maybe because you're not turning up and you're expecting the results and you're representing my name now in a way, like as in like I trained you, but you're going out and doing something else. Yeah. So it's like it's a bit like um I don't know you training a cyclist and then he turns up on a scooter, and it's like, but I, but, 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 you're like. We didn't train on a skewer. Do you know what I mean? In a way, they do the, they they can do the wrong things. Now, then again, on the opposite side of that, I have some incredible athletes. So I have I have some incredible athletes that are so good. They're willing to pay the process. They don't see the dark times. They don't see when you're going to be off injured and or you have to get a surgery and you have to recover or you have to you have to keep your weight down. So where people think like they don't see that, so it doesn't exist. So if someone comes to me and go, I go to somebody and say, Roy, I want to climb Everest. They'll go, oh, that's going to take a lot of training, even if they don't know. But fighting's not like that for some reason. Everyone has this entitlement to like, oh, yeah, we can bang, bro, yeah? Yeah, we can fight. Had 10, 10 street fights, yeah? You know what I mean? You're like, it's like, you're like, it's like, if someone comes to me and says they want to fight in the UFC, they basically came to me and said, I want to perform in the Tour de France. And now we get people, right now, and I'll probably get, I won't get in trouble for saying this because I don't get in trouble anymore because I don't, <laughs> I don't even listen to trouble, you know what I mean? But we had an Irish guy fighting in the UFC last week. I don't know if you know, but he should not be in the UFC and someone else needs to say it. I always seem to be the person to say it, but as I said, I don't, I don't, I don't do jealousy. I don't do all this. I do truth. I do, so I'm going to say it. And people are like, don't say it. And my girlfriend's always like, don't say it. And I'm like, I'm going to say it. Shouldn't have been there. We got disqualified in the first round. Um, we, we had the gave, biggest uh, opportunity in his life ever. We have other athletes in this country then where they have paid the process over and over and over again. And I would get frustrated seeing somebody jump in the queue and, and taking that from them. And people would go, yeah, well, you should be happy for everybody that's in there. Like, imagine somebody cycling the Tour de France where you're like, he's shy. And you're like, yeah, well, you better get behind him because he's Irish. But is there, a, if you zoom out and you look at it, is the decision to put someone into UFC, is it multifaceted? Is it, you know, you talk about there's, it's not straight up who's the baddest man in the world anymore. No. It's, there's a branding element to it. There's a, you know, I'm bring, he's bringing a new audience to it. There's probably a, he has a big social following element to it. You have many different elements to it now. Yeah, but that, that uh, the thing is, I can't understand it. And I don't think another people, well, whatever. And I wish the best to people. Even when that happens, I wish the best to them. But the other night exactly happened what, like, was what I was, what, not that I was fearing, but it's like, we don't want the, we'd built a, we built a big brand in the UFC as in the Irish being there, the fighting Irish. And if we start representing it with people who are probably not up to scratch, I just, I just don't know. Like, you know what I mean? We built a big thing, bringing the UFC back to Dublin and all. Connor did that. Connor did, I happened to be part of that in that where I got to go out and fight and do that thing. And, and as I said, people bring criticism now. When well, it's constructive criticism from somebody who is is um, qualified enough. Well, you've you have know the right to have an opinion on yeah, it. Like, but, and I listen to this in cycling all the time. And people are having the opinion. I'm like, like, shut up. Like, you don't get to have that opinion. <laughs> you know, it used to frustrate yeah. me with soccer because I, you know, I grew up every, my life, my two lives, so the soccer life and the cycling life. And up until I was 17, like, all I'd done was on the streets playing football all day long. It's never bothered at school because I just thought it was pointless. I'm going to be a, a pro yeah, footballer. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm going to school. I mean, my thinks there's bag, there's books in this bag, there's nets and there's a ball <laughs> in this bag. I'm hitting free kicks in the park till yeah. my feet bleed. But I think sometimes, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but uh, the question I meant to ask you on this before I got segued on that random journey was, uh, we spoke about John Lally. Uh, oh, yeah. John Lally's young lad, Max. Yes. How goes Max? Incredible. J Max is one of these lad, one of these kids as well that has has played the process over and over and over again. He's incredible. He, I remember, like I remember doing a seminar, I think, years ago, and Max was there like as a kid rolling around. He was always interested in this, and I think with his father's guidance and stuff like that and all, because he his dad has got like a sport background. Because let me tell you one thing, and you know this as well. I'm not telling you, I'm telling whoever's listening and stuff like that. People think like that someone's gonna walk past a park and see someone playing football and going, Oh my god, look how good that kid is. I'm gonna ring my mate that's a scout, and now he's gonna play for you. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> It doesn't know. It's so much more political than that, you know. Like there, there could be someone in the way that goes like, like I hate him or I hate his coach, and they can up subconsciously try and get in the way. You know what I mean? Where I think uh, John is going to be a great guide for Max. And if you think of the great fighters, think of them. Um, the Welsh guy, what's his name? Kalzagi. Where is that? Um, 
Khabib, where is Da? Tyson Fury, where is Da? Gunny Nelson, where is Da? These people that are really have somebody that actually gives... You can even throw Tyson in there as well with Customato. Yeah, Customato, you know. So I think when you have got a real guide with you that actually is emotionally invested, but not emotionally invested where they're trying to get their own success because some coaches can precariously live through their athletes to get their, um, get, to get their own success because they probably never got it themselves. You know what I mean, in a way? Uh, they never got satisfied in what they did in their career. So they flog some young lad forever, <laughs> you know what I mean? Until he gets it and then they they hold up the trophy or something, you know? So There's a Buddhist uh, saying that some people come into your life for a reason, others come into your life for a season, others come into your life for a lifetime. Oh, that's a so great you, You've three different types of interactions you have with people. Do you look back, when I was listening to you and reading the extract from your book, which is brilliant, by the way, nice. uh, I was reading an extract from your book and you are talking about your old coach, John Kavanagh. Yeah. I think about that saying and I think about someone that came into your life for a season and that season now was maybe past or have you rekindled that friendship? I, I don't have a call. I don't talk to John. We don't talk at all, unfortunately. You know what I mean? It's just one of them things is, listen, I am massively grateful for everything I have got in my life and every lesson I've been taught by people, I've, I hold no bitterness or badness for anybody. Do you know why? Because that's that would be that would be eating me, you know. So um, we just don't have a relationship. Um, you say it unfortunately. Is there a regret there? Um, well, I think that anybody who would be like would 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 have given forward for somebody, or who would have trained under somebody, or, or been mentored by somebody, would probably always have that that connection. Like where I just don't think when I I don't know when I retired, I may want to just have just I just stopped. You know what I mean? And it was kind of like a a process where like. We were either doing something together and that, that was the only reason we had a conversation. There was never any kind of like conversation outside that, you know, like... Um, was it just an entirely professional relationship? Uh, yeah, you could kind of say that, you know, and then there was times where it's like, I think maybe probably didn't see how big some of the decisions he was making regarding you know, on my side, what my effect would have been from decisions that were being made, you know, so where sometimes you can be flying through life, it's so busy, and you can be like, what, what? You know, but you don't understand that that person standing there going, this is everything to me. So I need you to make a little think about this process or think about this situation because this is everything, all of it. And it's kind of like, if someone's just rushing too fast, sometimes you just have to kind of like, I don't know, cut them toys and, and as I don't hold them emotionally because you can't. Do you think with a more experienced head now with the life experience you've gained now, if you transplanted that back to then, would uh, the dynamic of your relationship been different? Would you have taken control of different matters that you maybe just handed off to him? You can't change people. That's a thing as well. You can change people. So just just because sometimes you know something or you think it, you can't change people. So I don't I don't know if John is that person. That's been straight with you. You know I don't know. If, and I think maybe because he has to he does so much that he has to be a little bit kind of like straightforward. You know and like there's no time to stop and be like, now oh, hold on here and. I don't know, you know, just I didn't have that relationship I feel as much, you know, and um, I, maybe at the time I did, but after I didn't think, you know. You know, it's a really difficult part of every sport is the transition of finishing up your career. Mm -hmm. And I think we don't do enough for athlete welfare. We celebrate these massive successes of Olympic athletes, professional UFC fighters, cyclists, footballers. I had Nicholas Roach on the podcast a few times. You know, his son of Stephen Roach, massive pressure his whole career. Just finished up a brilliant career last year and it's like, boom, lights are off on Celebrity Dancing with the Stars. And it's like, no one wants to talk about, well, how are you getting on, Nico? How, how are you doing? Are you okay? Can we check in with you and see how you are? And it's like, did you have anything you could draw on? You know, you had a good family and stuff, but was there any professional supports you could draw on to say, okay, you're, you're, you're Paddy Hill and the UFC fighter, but now you're not Paddy Hill and the UFC fighter. Let's work on who you are. Oh, no. I, I was from from that time I retired I was like a wash machine falling down the stairs <laughs> it was everywhere all over the place and random nobody knew like it was just it was one of them situations I didn't I'll just be straight I'll be like, I'm not martyr or anything like that I don't have family that I can really go and have a conversation or talk to and I didn't really ever talk to anybody I'm pretty good at being able to not bury stuff and stuff like that but like I walk in the woods I swim in the sea I understand as I said at the start now I understand more that 
this is just a vessel, you know what I mean, in a way. And all of these things, I pray for some of these adversities at times because it's like, don't give me the, the easy life. Give me the, the strength to endure the hard one, you know, because I know that my spirit is being shaped and, and, and molded in this process of life or whatever it is. Um, and everything else outside that is kind of like, it's kind of bullshit. You know, and everyone else is on that vessel as well, on their own vessel. So, did did you have any work to do to understand who you are when you're seeing, when you look in the mirror, when you thought, "Well, I'm not a fighter anymore. What am I? Who am I?" I was, I was always a coach. Um, I was always, I've always coached. I when I was nineteen, I I done finished off coaching studies in Canada and stuff like that, and all. I'm always interested in athlete development, as I was saying there, and that's what I am obsessed with now. So I'm about five years into building my own team now. Um, we've some incredible athletes there, you know. So we've got, we've got, I've got my first first person who's turned professional, amazing. Um, Shauna Bannon, she just won a, a title. She fights for the next title, which is the the way up. And and I couldn't ask for somebody else as an athlete who was like she's incredible as an athlete. She's one of these people that's like this is what you need to do, and she does that, and she trusts you, you know. And then we've got athletes in Underhore and and just just some incredible athletes on my team now that I'm like um. I'm very blessed to be around, and not only my my team, as in like the people who fight from the gym or something like that, but my coaching squad and you know my facility. We've got like I'm blessed, but I built I built this with people who who are like angels. You know what I mean? So people who were really good people in my life, and they will be there forever. You know? And uh, do you uh, do you have any frustrations? I get this coaching, and I have to, you know, even I'll talk to Sarah at times about it and my frustration. When I'm coaching an athlete and the, I never had some of these shortcomings that now they have. And one of the big ones is just like doing your training sessions. Like no one ever had to push me out the door to do a training session. It was just automatic. It was like, it was like breathing. It's like, what am I doing today? Like I have a headache. It's raining. I'm sick. It's like you have good days and you have bad days at work. I just thought it's out the door. Do your training session. Just it's on paper. Execute. Do it. There was never like an excuse. Oh, I couldn't do my session today because... Boom. Like, there was no fill in the blank. It was sessions got done regardless. You know, me granny could die. The session would get done before the funeral that morning. And, you know, the worst shit has happened to me in my life. I, I don't miss me training sessions. And now I work with athletes and it's like, oh, I came home from work and I was a little bit tired. I didn't get me session in. And I have to, I have to nearly stop myself driving over to their house and going. That's, that's what, that's what um, that person I, I mentioned, Shauna, would be like. She would, Anything could happen. Anything. She would finish that session. There's another two guys, um, Sam and um, Dano. So I call them the dangerous duo. So the <laughs> jiu-jitsu guys, they're, the jiu-jitsu guys, I say that in a way because they're, they're more jiu-jitsu athletes. They don't really do MMA. Um, but they've been with me since their teens. Listen to this story. So there is people like yourself and still there, right? Um, I comes into the gym and they're over lifting weights with their school bag, their bags on and their jackets on and dressed ready to go home. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, well, we had a class to teach, so we just came down to finish off the last set. <laughs> and I just, I went back into the kitchen and I was like, I fucking love you. They're still there. They're still, they still exist. There's a mate of mine, I still ride with him. I was only riding with him last week and I was riding with a new group of lads and him. And he loved telling the story when we stopped for a coffee at the midway point. We were out and I was back from France and I was getting ready for the national championships. And we were doing, I was doing a 20 minute interval. And I was doing up around the back of the airport. And we're going around a roundabout with about five minutes left in this 20 minute effort. And it's 20 minutes, you know, close enough to full gas. So with five minutes left in the effort, going around the roundabout, he slid out, lost his back wheel, went down and broke his collarbone. And I was, looked at him, I was like, I'll be back for you in five minutes, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished the interval, I went back for him and he was gone. He was gone to the hospital. Someone had picked him up off the side of the road. <laughs> And I didn't even think anything about it. I was like, right, I have one more interval today. I'll get that done. Then I'll go home and figure out what happened to him. Where did he go to? And that's the zone. Like, and like I don't, I just trying to say to people, like, you need to be, like, see fighting these days. And, and the reason why I even mentioned the UFC and, and kind of anybody in the generation that's there now is because um, I'm trying to, like, if, if I was going to climb Everest or if I was going to do something like that I'd want someone to tell me what it was going to be like I wouldn't want them to give me like ah oh, you're going to be grand and a slap on the back it's not like that like mixed martial arts is one of the most hardest sports in the world I think you know what I mean in a way you've got everything going on you've got like knees elbows you've got like like someone's hitting you you've got to take them down you've got jiu jitsu you've got it all mixing in and it's very hard to stay calm and relaxed and all of that you know, be calm in the chaos but then some people it's like turbulence they can do two minutes and go for it and then they turn into a human again 
And then it's like, oh my God. But yeah, you, you, you got to be able to ride the wave. Like, say if you come out there, the blocks, but you go as fast as you can. Go, go, go. You're like, I'm winning the race and winning the race and winning the race. But you're not really, because you know the guys. That it, it's about pacing the surf. Yeah. They're gonna, they're gonna catch it. You're gonna be screwed. You're gonna blow your load. Is that what they say? Can you put that feeling into context for someone who, you know, like me, I probably never step into an octagon, or a listener who's never gonna step into an octagon. What's that like when you're a full house in the tree arena? You're headlining the fight. The announcement's done. The cage closes, and it's just you in the ring and another lad who wants to rip your head off. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's, it's probably the most. It's the most alive you'll ever feel. It's an absolute incredible feeling and it's like... Is it scary? Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, it's scary. It's all of them all mixed together. Like, I had to say, like, I, remember the fo- I remember what John saying to me, like, this is the fo- the last day of the, like, the rest of your life, basically. And I was like, what? And we walked out for Dublin and he was dead right. I couldn't walk out of the stadium after that, you know what I mean? It was a, it was great advice. Um, when I got to, to say, the, 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 the idea of walking into a cage, I was doing it in the basketball arena, which was down the road from my house. That was a lot more to risk because at that 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 age you weren't getting paid money or much money around for it, and you were putting yourself on on basically show in front of your whole house and estate. So that was a lot more vulnerable. But the time I got to the to, to the UFC, like especially the night I did fight the, my first fight in the UFC, you could have put Godzilla in there, and I would have killed him. I swear, <laughs> like that day when I look at that picture of myself walking out, that's not me. That is not me. I don't recognize that man. I had like left my body. I had just gave it over. I remember feeling my grandfather on my shoulder. You know what I mean? And I know that that sounds mad and spiritual, but the more I, as it, when you get younger, you're like you don't even want to admit that to yourself. But I was I was guided at times in there, and I went in there, be a, be a good guy. You know what I mean? At that day, probably got the hardest draw, and um, probably about from Connor with Diego Bandel of all of us, and um, was a bit of a hard draw. The guy I got. Division two wrestler that won three All American wrestling titles and had won six of his last or five of his last six fights and stuff like that. I was coming back from double back surgery, so he's a messy guy to fight. <laughs> and I'd been out for a year and a half, like because of my back surgeries. I had back surgery on the thirteenth of December, and then I fought in July. So I was, <laughs> I was like, today I could die, and I wouldn't give it. I wouldn't care. You know what I mean? I, that's. Maybe I'm too invested. <laughs> no, I think it's the nature of an athlete. I was just, as you were saying that, I was thinking back to my first Ross, which is the tour of Ireland. And I remember the first time being in the split with all the pros. And I was still in college. Came over the top of the Category 1 climb at Healy Pass. Came over the top. I said it was 25 of us left in the group. And I was like, oh, amazing. Then I thought, shit, now I have to go down Healy Pass with these lads. And I'm only starting bike race. And these lads are all experienced. It's a wet day. And I remember the first corner and thinking to myself, do you know what? If I die, I die. I'll go out happy here. It's a good story, and oh, it was just full commitment. People and won't understand that. I was like, "Oh my god, how was it? it?" It's like looking at someone else. When I I was writing this story out uh, the other day in a diary, and it's like writing a story about someone else. I don't recognize myself in that. It's like a drone following me down this descent, and that all the way back to the start of the conversation that we had, like jealousy envy all of these things your body will do things and your mind's gonna have to will it and it goes all the way back to even further of the conversation where body and mind is everything so if your body's massively out of shape and unfit your mind will be in the same place you'll very rarely find a really really healthy mind in in an unhealthy body that's what i think where the same way you won't you won't find a lot of um wisdom and youth in the same place it's like a lot of things don't belong where you've got to spend one to get the other. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it makes sense. So, so if you've got a, a, a bad body, a bad health, and you get better in that health, you work on it, you work on it, you'll get a better mind. If you've got a bad mind and you start working on your mind, you'll, you'll start helping a better body. So where I think people get to a stage where like spirits are growing in this body. You're hitting that corner there and your spirit's going, whatever. And even if you did die there, you probably end up in a place where you're, you don't have no regrets. You don't have the fear of like, or I slow it down and, and I let them beat me. You let the voice kick in and then you know what you have for the rest of your life. When you go to that place that I was talking about, that's what you have to face. That's what you have to answer to. No one else matters. <laughs> and I had Ian McCall on the podcast uh, who fought in the UFC oh, yeah, as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Ian McCall was in, um, Ian McCall was in my division. Was he, yeah. yeah. Really interesting. Uncle Creepy. Uncle Creepy, yeah. 
He was talking about now he's uh, I'm not sure if, how much you follow him anymore. He's a psychedelic integration coach, so he uses oh, really? psilocybin uh, okay. with his fighters. I read a book on this, and it's very very interesting. And we haven't really seen it too much. You know, depending on where you're listening to the podcast, it may or may not be legal, but. In some sports, you can take this. It's largely undetectable from what he's telling me in a lot of sports, but it's not on the WADA band list, I think. I'm not sure I would double-check that before anyone goes out yeah. and starts taking oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a voice. <laughs> Ring in. <laughs> but is, how tight is the doping controls in UFC? or how Because I know cycling, obviously, post the uh, US postal Lance Armstrong, it's, you know, it's non-negotiable. It's... You know, they're very, very heavily tested. I'm just off whereabouts only a few months. Brilliant. Uh, Jeff Slavinsky, is that his name? That was his name, yeah. That's the guy who got him, yeah. yeah. The reason why I know that is because I done like a seminar where I'm basically at the UFC telling us all about Lance and how he did it and how he did it. Like, to me, I just, I know the sound, there's nothing more disgusting than, than people doing PEDs. And that's just the way I know, especially in my sport. If you want to hear a ball faster and you want to inject something into your body to do it or something like that, go ahead. I want to punch somebody in the face and you want to, you want to take an injection to do it? I have a serious problem with that. I think somebody somebody should be brought for charges for like maybe, do you know what I mean? Like but the know. line's not black and white, is it? It's grey. Because it's like, what about then you're taking Tramadol, which isn't on the USADA band list, but it's undoubtedly performance enhancing. I've seen study after study on how performance enhancing it is. If you could get into a cage and fight on Tramadol, I'd be paid to see that. You know, because I, I took a Tramadol when I took my back surgery and I never took one ever again. Because I just couldn't get myself together. I like if anybody I know you understand as well, but like and now obviously we're talking about like so there's someone um like uh, the EPO, you know what I mean? Um what's his name? TJ Dillshaw. TJ Dillshaw won a title, had won a title, he had beat um he beat somebody that now is on a four for uh, losing streak, I think. But he, he tested positive for EPO when he did it. So did he take away someone else's chin? on a performance enhancing drugs with EPO and, and now that's it it's over it shouldn't be like that he's back fighting yeah. I have a blood disorder right? I can't fight in, and I said this in my, my retirement thing I can't fight in the UFC because I would harm myself <laughs> some of these people take EPO go and punch somebody else in the face and get a two years ban and then get put back into the UFC and is it happening how, how prevalent is it in there now oh the UFC's uh, drug um, thing is, is incredible Absolutely incredible. 24 7. Here it is. Um, you're on an app, basically, you look at yourself. They could knock, you have to let yourself know where, where people you are. So if you were going on holidays. So it's full whereabouts. Full stuff. whereabouts, 24 7. That's why John Jones hid under the cage, apparently. Did you ever hear that story? Uh-huh. He hid under the cage, apparently, when uh, they came from. Supposedly, now, this is, if you can read the story <laughs> online, ain't grassing on nobody. <laughs> but supposedly, he had a piss under the, under the cage. And they went in and took it. They took a sample from it. Jeez. And they were able to fight it out. He hit under for eight hours or something. Uh, Paddy, conscious of uh, time, uh, what, what's the future hold for you now? Um, I am just, t- the last little while I've just, I am just flying and the, the amount of planning I've done with stuff like that. So um, in the last five years since I retired, I've, like, I've been elected in my area, I've wrote a book, I've had, I've had three kids. I'm like, You're, Paddy's the most fertile man well, in Ireland. Yeah. We've been talking about this I'm sneezing. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> yeah, um, and so I would love to keep on the idea of to keep my, 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 my finger on the pulse of this politics thing, right? Because I do think that there's a lot of people who wish I would go away. I do think there's probably more moves in the in the, in the the way to maybe it's a conspiracy to, to, to kind of make me go away. You know what I mean? In that way. But uh, when I the most, the most inspiring thing that's happened the last little while is looking into that doll, seeing people going, you are, that's it, like... You are inspired the whole nation that if you can do it, anybody can do it. We're looking into a house full of millionaires. That's what we're looking into. And people who probably haven't got the life experience of most people that they're making rules for. People are now making rules with no consequences. So if they make, they're cutting the turf off and stuff like that. Like, like let's have no more turf, right? Eamon coming out with this stuff, like, he's asleep. Like, we are, we're absolutely embarrassing ourselves. That's what I feel. Well, this was my problem when I was in King's Inn, which is the only place you can qualify to be a barrister in Ireland. So every single person in my class, without exception, lovely people, but they're all in the upper levels of the socioeconomic mm-hmm. bracket. I was the only person in the entire class that had to take out a loan for their fees. Everyone else was handed that. So what happens? These people in law school, they go on to become barristers. They go on to become senior counsel. They go on to become judges. 
they go and become policymakers. Now, there's not a massive problem with that. The only thing is, in any debate now, we only have one socioeconomic viewpoint represented. And that's what our politics has largely become. And that's why I think it's brilliant that people like you are striking out and representing another opinion. And not to say your opinion's always going to be right and theirs Absolutely. is going to be wrong, but that's what a healthy democracy is about, challenging no, opinions. The thing is, what you're saying there is, right, is we talk about equality and all, only in places that were allowed... Well, that, well, don't talk about there, because that matters. Like... So should there not be like some sort of bar? And I do agree with this. So there's like um, obviously there's a, a gender equality um, where it, there has to be so many females and males in in, a, in a p- p- uh, positions and stuff like that. And I, I agree with that. You know what I mean? I think that's that they, they should be open and, and probably best person for the job as well. But when it comes to like say the the, the thing judges and stuff like that, should we have an equality process where there's so many people need to be middle class, so many people need to be working class, and and it could be like no best person for the job. Obviously, that's not the truth because the last judge that just got appointed in our country didn't even have anybody else challenging for the job. So how can you not win the race if you're the only cyclist, if you're the only fighter in the cage? Now, and some of this stuff where people be like, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not into politics and I'm trying to say to people like that, there's a small group of people in this country for the last hundred years who have been ruling everything that's going on and we're, we're running out of things to take because each generation that comes along is going to create something to take it. So when the NCT wasn't here, that got created. When the war, Irish war wasn't here, that got created. We're creeping into like, right, well, how do I get? But you know, it's like such a, a difficult one, buddy, because you're in, and I often think this separates people who are having conversations and who are challenging opinions and trying to progress in self-development, you need a space to do that. And if you if you journey back to the very origins of entertainment, it's the Colosseum and it's gladiators fighting each other. And why did they put that together? They put it together because it was a struggling political system at the time and they wanted to distract and stop the conversations being about politics and substantial matters. They wanted to distract the populace and have conversations about two lads killing each other inside the Colosseum. Now we have the Coliseum, but there's thousands of them. There's TikTok, there's Facebook, there's Instagram. There's, you know, Celebrity Big Brother. Everyone's distracted by everything. And we're so distracted and caught up in this nine to five rat race of trying to pay rent, trying to pay a lease on a car, trying to pay for clothes. And there's very few people in society that have, you know, through their own hard grit, through good fortune, whatever it is, they've gravitated and they've risen above that slightly. And, you know, they're not in a financial position where they need to go out and occupy all their creative energy doing someone else's work. And you can sit back and you can read the books on politics. You can read the books on history. You can question things about COVID. You can question agendas. But it's difficult to get people into that situation. When you look at who the next lawyer or who the next judge is going to be, it's difficult for them to come from working class families because we just we haven't got we haven't got a system that allows those working class families to get that headspace to say okay I'm going to put that few quid away to get little Johnny into law school down the road. So that's what they say when you keep people occupied by general needs, which is food and stuff. I think it's a great um, there's a great a picture of it in history. It's like they they the guy is throwing bread on the floor, but the guy is behind a, a, a locked door, a locked cell, but he has the keys here, and the guy is only concentrating on the food. Because he's not looking at the keys. Because yeah. the most important part is the is the is the bread that could be thrown on the floor. To me, what I think I can do, and people are like, well, I don't, I don't. As I said, I, I don't really care what people's opinion of me and stuff like that. And and some of the opinions I've had of me, and even on Twitter and stuff like that, are like are borderline racist. Like that's just being straight. Like, but like, look at how he says that. Look at what he says. Look at what he's wearing. Can't believe he's just wearing. You know, and I mean, like. If this was any other kind of nationality or a, it would be racist, right? But it's okay to be racist in a working class. Against gingers. Against gingers, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then, and then in Ireland, it's just, that's, 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 I think that's been the norm for a long time, which is like, it is all right to kind of like, say even with travelling communities and stuff like that and all, to be like, oh, you have to watch them over there. Like a, people can say them things, but, so what I think I can do is, I can, I'm not here with the answers. I am here with integrity and I will not be compromised. I will not be compromised. You will not be able to come with me, money, fame, a tre, anything like that and compromise me. Because as I said, I'd rather be dead than, than give up that stuff because when we get to the other side, you're going to have to face it. So as I said, I'm not religious, I'm not, I don't go to church or anything like that, but I, I know that there's something going on spiritually. I know there's a spirit in here. 
So I can't be compromised. And what I can do in my next years of my life is I hope that I can inspire some of the brains to show them that it is possible. I can run with that torch and say, look, we can do it. And, and, and if you sit in your garden all day smoking weed, it's not going to happen. We need to get rid of that. You need to start like, looking that politics does matter. And it doesn't only matter for us. It matters for the most important people, which is the people coming after us, is our kids and all. And the real people go, look, why would I put myself out here? Why would I say the stuff I say? Why would I bring the hassle to me? I, don't, I have mine. I'm all right. We could just sit back and be like, I'm all right, Jack. So what I'm trying to do is even the people that are against me, I'm trying to get you to see, look, and we can do this. So whether you're from Jobstown or whether you're from, from Clontarf, you know, I think me and you could have a great conversation and we get on. I'm not saying that everybody's different and, and anybody's good and anybody's bad. All I'm trying to say is that we need to stop looking out for the stupid shit and we need to start looking out for the right stuff. Let's make this country where, it, say, people, there's a great, I have to say this, all right, because it gets said now that people say, oh, we should be looking after our own first. I think that wording is planted um, to kind of separate us straight away. All right? Our own is human. All right, but it's made out that if you said that, they would say, so, or, so you're far right because you only want to look after the Irish. No, we should look after people that we bring into this country as refugees and look at the people that are in direct provision and stuff like that. Why? Because they're human. And everybody that calls this place home should get a chance to be able to live a proper life here. You can't be, you can't, you can't be separating nationalities and, and, then, and then calling someone else racist. And then it, Humans are humans. Let's start getting the housing thing sorted. We've got loads of land. We've got loads of resources. We've got all of the, the, the wind, all this kind of stuff. You've got data centres getting announced and made while they're telling the people not to burn their turf and their fire. It's ridiculous. It makes no sense. And the reason why it is, because it's coming from people that don't live in the real world. It's coming from someone that can fall asleep on television in Dal Erden and keep their job. If I fell asleep in my job and I worked in the ESP or something like that, I'd probably be sacked if you worked in the UFC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if I fell asleep, you'd definitely be, getting, you'd definitely be losing your job. Paddy, you talked Thanks. about uh, the first Irish lad coming into the UFC and the success off the back of that. You and Connor just seeing that and following him. I'm a big fan of that. Can't see me, can't be me. And I think it's a nice way to end the podcast because right now you are that inspiration, whether you know it or not, for a lot of people in working class communities to strive for a little bit better to start asking questions. So good job on that. And That's thanks normal. for joining me. Thank you, man. It's an absolute honor. Cheers, buddy. Appreciate it.